66 million years ago. POV, you're a dinosaur. That's pretty much the groundbreaking event that changed modern life as we know it. The end of the age of the dinosaurs. A cataclysmic event that killed every known avian and dinosaurs and allowed mammals to conquer the world in their absence. The evolutionary achievements and changes in climate that followed the aftermath of the extinction are compiled in a 66 million year long era known as the Cenozoic, denominated the Age of the Mammals, as it was the point where this group of animals presented itself as the most diverse when compared to the previous era, the Mesozoic Era, where they barely surpassed the size of a cat. We have to thank the violent impact of the asteroid 66 million years ago, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But what if we weren't? What if the violent asteroid event that dictated the end of the age of the dinosaurs never hit Earth? What if, without any barrier, the age of the dinosaurs could continue until the present? How would life look like today in this bizarre alternate timeline? Taking into context, 66 million years ago, the world was a lush place. The world was teeming with dinosaurs of all shapes and sizes, from small avialins flying between gaps of dense vegetation to giant sauropods that envy any other animal in terms of size. Beyond that, a myriad of other creatures lived alongside these. In the air, pterosaurs shared the skies with birds and their volant relatives. In the seas, various species of primitive fish forms were abundant, as well as marine reptiles, like the diverse plesiosaurs and the newly formed apex predatory mosasaurs. Ammonites and other prehistoric mollusks were rocking on the lush oceanic plains of existence. Even on land, dinosaurs were not the only oddities. Terrestrial crocodilomorphs dominated various portions of land and adopted unique and weird lifestyles. Various species of small primitive mammaliomorphs that are now extinct were spread and abundant across the world in an enviable diversity. The world was amazing. Suddenly, the rock crashed into Earth and caused most of the diversity to perish in an event known as the KPG extinction event. It is estimated that 75% of the species that lived back then went extinct. That still leaves a quarter of the life that exists back then to survive which is a fair amount. This marks the last of the big five mass extinctions that occurred in the last 500 million years. The effects of the extinction were devastating. Every dinosaur died at that event, with the exception of birds and likely a few very close relatives. Pterosaurs went extinct too, as well as mosasaurs and plesiosaurs. Terrestrial crocodilomorphs were also almost extinct. Mammaliomorphs also suffered some heavy losses, but in comparison to the groups mentioned immediately before, managed to survive pretty well. No wonder, after all, they became the dominant megafauna of the Cenozoic era. During the course of the next 66 million years, the climate changed dramatically, ranging from global tropical temperatures to violent ice ages, and it was divided into six major epochs. The Paleocene, the Eocene, the Oligocene, the Miocene, the Pliocene, and the Pleistocene. The Paleocene ranged from 66 to 55 million years ago. It was a time when the Cenozoic was at its hottest, with tropical rainforests spread across most of the world, including Antarctica and Greenland, which allowed for spreading of various animals across the globe. In the Cenozoic, this was a very short window that allowed mammals to diversify into a myriad of forms. The Paleocene ended with the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, a moment when Earth's climate went at the hottest maximum point during the Cenozoic, which caused the proliferation of some species and the extinction of others. The Eocene was a much longer period, ranging from 55 to 33 million years. It was relatively warm too, and it saw the diversification of more modern groups of mammals, including aquatic mammals like cetaceans. The Eocene eventually ended with the most violent extinction event of the Cenozoic, one that saw the separation of Australia from Antarctica, for instance, promoting a gigantic shift in oceanic currents and, overall, forced a shift in climate, causing it to become relatively cooler. This proved fatal for some oceanic life, but the climate was still warmer than today, even though ice caps were starting to form in Antarctica. 
the Oligocene Epoch lasted from 33 to 23 million years and saw a general aridification, eliminating many rainforest regions of the globe and allowing for the proliferation of a brand new wave of plant domination, grasses. Grasslands were starting to get more abundant and therefore animals had to adapt to the new vegetation. Then we reached to the Miocene that lasted from 23 to 5 million years, which saw more severe changes in the climate towards a colder climate. Antarctica separated from South America, creating a circumpolar current around Antarctica and increasingly making it colder and more icy. Global cold environments promote a drier world, as water is retained as ice in the poles. This killed some lush forest regions, for example, in Europe, where many native reptiles went extinct with the colder climates, and the promotion of grasslands may have doomed the last Sebekosupians of South America, the predatory remnants of the main lineage of Mesozoic terrestrial crocodilomorphs, which were maybe more adapted for more moist and forested environments rather than dry open lands. This, however, promoted the formation of more grasslands and allowed some arboreal animals to shift to more terrestrial lifestyles, for example, as evidenced by ground sloths, old world monkeys, and apes too, slowly giving rise to humankind as the African rainforests were cleared up. The Pliocene, lasting from 5 to 2 million years, was an extension of this dry, cold climate as the continent adopted an increasingly more modern appearance. One of the most important moments of the Pliocene was the increasing of the Ice Age effects and new interchanges. For example, South America interchanges with North America with the formation of the Isthmus, allowing for North and South American fauna to coexist with each other or perish in the wake of competition. The end of the Pliocene was eventually marked by the more violent Ice Ages. Ice Ages reaped the Pliocene for the last two and a half million years, with a series of cold and warm periods, lasting a few dozens of thousands of years each. The formation of Ice Ages lowered the sea levels, providing radical changes in the shorelines of the continents, forcing a lot of creatures to either adapt or die. The Megalodon shark, for instance, was one of the casualties their preferred breeding grounds being corrupted. Some that were particularly benefit from this change were, for instance, baleen whales, whose cold climates allowed for the proliferation of krill stock and allowed for the formation of the largest animals that Earth has ever seen. This was also a turning point for humans to scheme their world domination and expand to nearly every continent of the globe. All of these climatic changes that the Cenozoic has suffered would be particularly important to guess how exactly Mesozoic creatures would adapt. So, if the asteroid event didn't occur, most of these climatic changes would occur, and the Mesozoic life would have to adapt to the changes of climate, which we can somewhat guess, based on various evidence that we can obtain. This will help us have a clear picture on what could be living today, had the KPG extinction event never happened. I believe the best strategy is grab each important clay of animals that existed in the late Cretaceous and more or less guess how these would be affected with the next 66 million years. It is a lot to unpack, really, and there may be some groups that will sadly be overlooked, but I will try to cover what I feel is the most relevant. And I think the first group that I will try to handle are the Mammaliomorphs, which is specifically important for us, as we are Mammaliomorphs after all. So, Mammaliomorphs, despite not having suffered that much in extinctions in comparison to some other groups, were still very much influenced by the KPG extinction event. Firstly, because the vacant guilds allowed mammals to fastly adapt to huge sizes and new guilds as fast as a lightning strike. It was so sudden that it was basically a filter. Placentals diversified into larger forms so quickly because they were more adapt for that task than many other Mammaliomorphs, as they had erect limbs and increased metabolism and a more advanced reproductive strategy. This was also allied to the fact that Metatherians, the group that includes marsupials and extinct kin, was heavily affected by the KPG. The Metatherians that survived the KPG extinction event were a result of luck, basically. In North America particularly, we can observe how the KPG was especially devastating for Metatherians, no wonder given that's where the asteroid was hit. It is believed the impact was more severe for the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere, and maybe that is why Methetherians ended up proliferating in the Southern continents in our timeline. However, without the KPG, 
Metatherians would be proliferating in almost every region of the globe, at least in the beginning. Cat-sized predators were abundant, as well as weasel-like omnivores, arboreal possum-like mammals and shrew-like forms were abundant across the globe. However, that does not mean placentals won't have an upper hand still. After all, they have a much better form of reproduction. Unlike Metatherians and most non-placental Eutherians that lived back then, placentals gave birth to young without laying them on a pouch. That is because they lack proper epipubic bones, small bones that are usually associated with the stiffening of a mammal's underside, preventing them to develop large offspring in their womb. This forces most non-placental mammals to develop small young. Placentals have originated in the mid-Cretaceous, already with a radically different form of reproduction, which allows them to give birth to young outside of a pouch, and in some species this promotes precociality. In this sense, placentals have some interesting advantages as well. Metatherians likely suffered a lot in the KPG because they were largely active animals in open spaces, against the likely more burrowing lifestyle that placentals had. This is evidenced by the color vision mammals have. Many marsupials nowadays have trichromatic vision, usually associated with seeing a myriad of colors, which makes sense for an animal that does not live underground. Many placentals, however, don't have trichromatic vision and can detect less colors, possibly associated with an ancient subterranean lifestyle. This is important, given that hiding yourself underground was one of the major forms of survival that mammals adopted against the extinction, and metatherians were more affected due to a possibly greater reliance in the exterior. In an OKPG world, metatherians would remain specially abundant in the early days, while placentals diversify in the background. Placentals, with this novel reproduction, could explore new roles, such as aquatic roles. I wouldn't be surprised that in this hypothetical timeline, a sea otter-like placental could evolve, for instance. Metatherians could theoretically explore aquatic lifestyles, but they are very limited in that aspect in comparison. They can also fly, as, unlike pouch mammals that require proper hand scrap to the mother's tits when still in the pouch, placentals are now free to expand and modify their front limbs into a myriad of structures, such as wings, flippers and even hooves something metatherians and other pouch mammals would have trouble developing. In this sense, placentals could coexist with pouch mammals as they developed brand new gills their relatives cannot adopt. But one important feature may also be the metabolism. Ice ages will form by the end of the Cenozoic, and many mammals have suffered from the arrival of the ice, and those that can't adapt their inner body temperature control to these new environments may suffer. Metatherians don't have a history of adapting too well to the cold. Surely there are a few exceptions, like the Virginian opossum, that has managed to go around that problem, but beyond exceptions, it's reasonable to believe placentals will see an increased global proliferation in the wake of the ice ages, especially the Boreocir branch, the one that includes modern rodents, primates, shrews, hedgehogs, moles, bats, whales and other junglets, pangolins and carnivorans. It's pretty likely that, in the warmer regions, pouched mammals will be abundant somehow, as long as they are not outcompeted by the rampant proliferation of placentals. Australia, for instance, just like in our timeline, could be a safe refuge for the domination of metatherians and dryolestans, though they would likely have trouble evolving into aquatic or hoofed animals, unlike the placentals. And it's not unreasonable to expect kangaroo-like forms would evolve, with free ends to allow for younger forms to climb the pouch and grab to their mother's tits, while developing cursorial lifestyles. Not just in Australia, but in many tropical grasslands across the world, with maybe other lineages of metatherians and pouch eutherians like leptictilans, salamdalestids and orzelestids. In the rainforests, Mesotherians and pouched Eutherians could still develop interesting lifestyles as arboreal possum-like creatures, or on the forest floor as shrew-like foragers. The mammals we have spoke about right now were part of the Cladotheria clade, a clade of viviparous mammals that has two pairs of erect limbs. By the end of the Mesozoic, these included the Dryolestans, as well as the more modern lineages like Mesotherians, marsupials and kin, and the Eustherians, placentals and their extinct pouch relatives. However, there were other types of more primitive mammals. One interesting and abundant group was the multituberculid group. Multituberculids, by the end of the Mesozoic, were known to exist in the Northern Hemisphere. 
these were largely rodent-like animals with a varied and rich history. In our timeline, the extinction was generous to the multituberculates as well, and they were abundant, at least in Europe and North America, before climate change and competition with the newly evolved rodents led them to an increased extinction. It is believed that the KPG led to a large portion of Asian multituberculates to go extinct, which allowed rodents to evolve in their place in that region. If true, then the lack of a KPG would prevent multituberculates from being taken down that easily, especially as many Asian multituberculates were a bit more adapted to more arid and ground-dwelling habits. Other multituberculates were more dependent on the forests which, by the end of the Eocene, were disappearing and might have caused the extinction of several groups. It is pretty possible other mammals replaced multituberculates by evolving a rodent-like lifestyle, like zelestids or even placentals, and the violent changes in climate that may follow might yet again prove harsh for the multituberculates and the multimillion-year-old lineage, no pun intended, could be on the brink of collapse. I do believe multituberculates could still survive up until the present, but they may not adopt the same diversity as they had. And now we move to the basalmost mammals, the monotremes. These are well known for being the only known modern mammals that lay eggs, including the modern platypus and echidna. We know for a fact that they survived the KPG in Australia, as platypus like freshwater animals. We could be seeing forms not very different from nowadays living in Australia. We also have one very curious and interesting group of mammalimorphs, the Gondwana seers. Gondwana seers are pretty enigmatic animals. For instance, we don't know exactly where they are positioned in the phylogenetic tree. We don't even know if they were or if they weren't mammals. Sometimes they are associated with multituberculates thanks to a similar dentition and morphology. Other times they are seen as stem mammals, very close to true mammals themselves. Whatever their phylogenetic position, they are seen as pretty important faunal assemblages to the southern continents. They were present in Africa, Madagascar, India, South America, and even Antarctica. They were one of the first mammalimorphs to adapt to a grass-based diet, and therefore they could have a future of success as grasslands expand. With their expansion and diversification in the warmer and lush isolated south, one could very well expect that Gondwana seeders wouldn't be as severely affected as multi-tuberculates in the north, adapted for ground-dwelling habits and with diets adapted for the changing times. Of course, needless to say, despite the mammalimorphs' diversification, they will stay pretty small in general. Maybe some species could surpass a meter in length at best, however, with the ice ages, maybe mammals have more freedom to grow larger, as they are more adapted to the cold than most other animals that they share the world with. The Mesozoic era was more of a shining moment for reptiles of all shapes and sizes. We'll start speaking about Lepidosaurs, the group that includes modern lizards and the other modern relatives, the Tuatara. Tuataras are part of the Rhynchocephalia group, a group that was very successful in the Triassic and the Jurassic, but slowly diminished in diversity as lizards start to evolve and diversify. By the end of the Cretaceous, only two groups of Rhynchocephalians were alive, the Opisodontians and the Sphenodontids. Opisodontians were once found as small herbivorous reptiles from South America, but they were already in decline anyway, so I would have doubts that they would have been around in the present. In New Zealand, without much competition and decent isolation, however, Sphenodontids survive. Just like in our timeline, we could expect Tuataras to exist in a similar geographical distribution as they would. Lizards would have a much bigger diversity. Lizards are already diverse with a myriad of different groups, like skinks, geckos, worm lizards, snakes, etc., would still exist and proliferate. However, few know how many lizard groups existed in the past, during the late Cretaceous, that eventually perished. For example, the Polyglyphenodontians, a widespread group of lizards that had different dietary habits. These included animals like the 50 cm long herbivorous camops, or the more omnivorous Polyglyphenodon. I wouldn't doubt they could diversify even more without extinction. Iguanians would also adopt different shapes and behaviors. Chameleons, for example, wouldn't exist in this alternate timeline, as they evolved after the extinction in our timeline. But their relatives would be present, and maybe they could develop other roots. But there is one group of lizards that is titanically more different from all others and more iconic. The Mosasaurs. 
These were one of the apex predators of the oceans of the globe. These were interestingly endothermic, that is, they were not cold-blooded, a strategy that granted them a good way in surviving in slightly cold waters. Mosasaurs adapted various forms, sizes and dietary preferences, which indicate their versatility. One shouldn't be surprised mosasaurs could start to become increasingly more adapted for aquatic locomotion, maybe even evolving more fish-like bodies. Given they were endothermic, the ice ages shouldn't bring much of a problem for their new diversity. Mosasaurs were not alone in their aquatic domain. Plesiosaurs were also around, and they were also very diverse at the end of the Cretaceous. Plesiosaurs are more well known for their long-necked forms, but short-necked forms existed, like the polycotylids. These were smaller, with long snouts to feed on fish and cephalopods. They were not very abundant by the end of the Cretaceous, so they could face death in a possible oceanic crisis, like the one experienced at the end of the Eocene. The long-necked variety are known as elasmosaurids. These were much more diverse, with giant ones that had visibly titanically long necks, adapted for hunting shoals of fish, while others had relatively shorter necks and more boxy skulls adapted for cephalopods and maybe even filter feeding. With the Ice Age arrival, the conditions for filter feeding animals will only increase, and plesiosaurs were already warm-blooded and adapted for cold weather, so they may proliferate even more. However, I wouldn't be surprised some more predatory forms eventually evolved from these. After all, they had pretty menacing teeth. We then move to turtles. Turtles have a lot to unpack, and we could have an entire video talking just about the ridiculous amount of turtle clades that existed back then. So, um, I'll try to be brief. So turtles have a ridiculous diversity. Fortunately, to narrow us down, turtles were largely not affected by the effects of the KPG so we should expect the modern diversity to remain the same in this alternate timeline. Of course, we should be also counting the turtle diversity that existed before human caused extinctions. Stem turtles like the Mayolanoids would likely also exist in this altered timeline, and just like our timeline, they could exist in Oceania in very recent times. Sea turtles were a group that suffered heavily in the KPG, contrary to what some may believe. Giant sea turtles like the Protostegids existed, for instance, and some others too, like the Toxocalids. Maybe we could see more sea turtle diversity in this world. Other types of reptiles existed back then in the Cretaceous that are not alive today, such as the enigmatic Choristodirs. These were very weird reptiles, with many scientists believing a good portion of these were aquatic viviparous animals. They have survived the extinction event on our timeline very well, but eventually went extinct as climate change occurred. They were found largely in the northern hemisphere, and as conditions got drier, Charistodirs started to vanish. Sadly, there would be little indication for a different outcome in the no-KPG timeline. Now we go to crocs. Modern crocodilomorphs are those well-known aquatic carnivores with long jaws and sharp teeth that munch anything that gets in their way. The past holds a much wider diversity of these reptiles, with fully terrestrial forms and even marine forms existing, from various shapes and sizes. Notosuchians and similarly terrestrial crocodilomorphs were specially abundant. Notosuchian literally stands for Southern Crocodile, which is coherent as a wide variety of these were found in the Southern continents, like South America, Africa, Madagascar and India, as well as Europe, which is not in the south but was connected to Africa at one point, allowing for interchange. As India collides with Asia and Europe connects with Asia and North America, Nozusukians would be spread across the world now, with various small forms scurrying around, as well as large quadrupedal Sebekusukian predators. In the south, they would also have a blast. However, as the world gets drier and colder, we could expect an increased decline in Nozusukian diversity. Madagascar might be a safe tropical refuge to preserve the original diversity, with large predatory Mahajangasukids patrolling the highland, while herbivorous armored forms descended from Simosukids would munch on the plant life, fearing their predatory kin. There would still be ground for Notosukians to adapt to drier environment. South Asia, Africa, Central and South America would still be good places to see these terrestrial crocs diversify in all sorts of ways. Perhaps they could even reach Australia, despite it being one of the driest places on Earth right now. Other crocodilomorphs were more traditional in terms of shape, looking more croc-like in that particular sense. These were the Neosuchians, the lineage that leads to crocodilians and their extinct relatives. 
A variety of these existed. Some were likely more terrestrial than aquatic, such as the Atoposaurids, literally end-sized crocs that scurried in the rainforests of what is now Europe. Climate change may prove to be especially hard for them to survive, as the tropical regions of Europe dry out, however. Pholidosaurids, Goniopholidids, and Dirosaurids existed in the late Cretaceous, and these were very much like your typical crocodilian. Dirosaurids, in particular, seem to have explored marine territory more than once. Goniopholidids were already in decline as new forms developed, and Pholidosaurids followed these, but apparently Pholidosaurids did survive the KPG, only to go extinct not long after. Dirosaurids' unique lifestyle is impressive, and they had little competition. They also survived the KPG extinction, but went extinct in the Eocene, possibly due to climate change, and I don't see why the lack of a KPG would influence the long-lasting survival in that case. One varied group of Neosuchians was basically a sister clay to crocodilians. These included animals like the Borealisuchus and the Soracosaurs. These were superficially very, very crocodilian-like, and, despite surviving the KBG, their extinction in our timeline might have been a product of a rampant diversification of true crocodilians from the aftermath of the extinction. Soracosaurs, in particular, could survive in the present, in the form of gario-like forms. True crocodilians would be still pretty common in the tropical regions. Crocodiloids could evolve to crocodile or gario-like forms. By far, the most unique would be the alligatoroids, as they are more diverse than most other crocodilians. Their jaws would be perfectly adapted to hunt and eat turtles and other hard foods, which would allow for an increased diversity especially in the Americas, just like in our timeline. In the skies of the Mesozoic, one of the most notable and emblematic flying creatures were undoubtedly the pterosaurs. They have originated in the Triassic and through the Cretaceous for over 160 million years. However, by the late Cretaceous, the diversity of yore that pterosaurs had was a bit more diminished, presumably due to the coexistence they had to endure with avialids, that is, birds and kin. Surely pterosaurs and avialids coexisted with each other very fine, but many guilds previously held by pterosaurs were eventually replaced by avialids, leaving pterosaurs to dominate other roles, and presumably that's what promoted them to become gigantic. Among the most relevant pterosaur groups of the end of the Cretaceous were the Asdarkids, the Pteranodontids, and the Nyctosaurids. Asdarkids were the most abundant, widespread, opportunistic, emblematic, and also the largest of all of the pterosaurs in the end of the Mesozoic. They were the largest flying creatures that have ever existed, reaching wingspans of up to 10 to 12 meters, though smaller species with 1 to 2 meters in wingspan did exist. These were characterized for having long necks and huge bills, spending a lot of time on the ground, like a stork or a hornbill. Surely there would be little to prevent them from being widespread across the globe in tropical and temperate regions. Pteranodontids and Nyctosaurids were closely related to each other. They were toothless and were very predominant around the sea. Nyctosaurids were especially peculiar for some having no functional walking fingers at the tip of their wings. The exact reason is not known, but could be a particular indication that they were increasingly adapted for a much more aerial and or aquatic lifestyle, not needing to go on land except to lay their eggs. Alcyon was a very small nyctosaurid that shows well-defined adaptations for swimming and diving underwater. I couldn't expect that these aquatic pterosaurs would not have a bright abundance in the present day. But now we go to odd topics, the dinosaurs. Needless to say, the dinosaurs take the spotlight of the big Cretaceous inhabitants, and there was so much diversity back then, ranging from obligate herbivores to obligate carnivores, ranging from scaly reptilian chonkers to feathery fluffy boys, ranging from tiny feathered flyers to titanic skyscraping monstrosities. Dinosaurs have a lot to unpack, and I think it is relevant to spend a little bit more time with these as their diversity will likely have a stark contrast in the present when compared to the end of the Cretaceous. So let's start with the most hardy, the ankylosaurs. These were herbivorous animals covered in osteoderms across their body, formidable shields against ferocious carnivores. Some even evolved clubs at the end of their tails to use as offensive weapons. Ankylosaurs were known to have been widespread across most of the world during the late Cretaceous, with Africa being a likely exception. One important thing to take into account is their diet. 
As we know, the Cenozoic is a moment of strong floral overhaul. Forests will increasingly disappear as the world gets drier and grasslands dominate. Ankylosaurs were kind of adapted for fern-like diets. Nodosaurids, which consisted of the most clubless ankylosaurs, were a bit more selective in their diet, complementing it with conifers and other more woody plants. One could expect them adapting to a more grass-based diet. This can be evidenced by nodosaurid elongated snouts in contrast to the more abrasive ankylosaurid mouths. But the changing climate may prove specially hardy for ankylosaurs, and even if they survive, they may not present that much of a relevance. Ankylosaurs were part of a very well-defined group of mostly herbivorous dinosaurs, the Ornithischians. Apart from ankylosaurs, Ornithischians, at the end of the Cretaceous, were part of the wider and more diverse Neornithischia clade, which consisted of very small, possibly feathered basal members, like the Descalosaurs, and two of the most important Neornithischian groups, the Marginocephalians and the Ornithopods. Tessalosaurs were found in the Northern Hemisphere, more notoriously in North America. Tessalosaurus is hypothesized to not have been a very good runner, in comparison to many other bipedal herbivores of a similar size, and they may have swam into the water for refuge or even borrowed. One could hypothesize that Tessalosaurus could eventually evolve into more ground-dwelling burrowing lineages or even aquatic lineages, though it is not implausible to think these couldn't explore more cursorial guilds. Marginocephalians are notable for including the Pachycephalosaurs and the Ceratopsians. The Pachycephalosaurs were bipedal and characterized for often displaying domes on their heads for combat and display, though some more primitive species were characterized for flatter skulls. These animals were herbivores, though there are theories regarding possible omnivory. There are also evidence that Pachycephalosaurs had elongated sharp teeth, not too different from what we see in chevrotains, for instance. Pachycephalosaurs had simple dentition, and given their basality, we could infer that they could be covered in feathers, though that is hard to take into certainty, especially because we have no fossilized integument known from these dinosaurs. Pachycephalosaurs, however, could find themselves widespread across a good portion of the globe. Ceratopsians were a much more diverse group. These diversified from the basal and bipedal Micropachycephalosaurus to more quadrupedal forms like Celeptoceratopsians and the Ceratopsids, the latter being much more emblematic due to having large brow and nasal horns and exaggerated frills. Ceratopsians were super diverse for millions of years, but they may suffer an accentuated decline if they don't adapt themselves to new vegetations. Ceratopsians were much more adapted for woody plants, and the arrival of grasslands may limit their distribution to woody or bushy terrain. We know that ceratopsians were also largely scaly, and this might be specially restrictive in their range as ice ages arrive, potentially forcing them to largely stick with temperate, subtropical and tropical regions. Ornithopods were classified with several different groups by the end of the Cretaceous, and they were widespread in every continent. Elasmarians were a proper example. Their phylogenetic position is kind of debated, and when they are classified as ornithopods, they are usually regarded as basal ones. Elasmarians were found in South America, Antarctica and Australia. Given that Elasmarians were already known to have inhabited somewhat cold environments, so they may have been covered in feathers, at least the smallest species. This might be specially beneficial for them in the Ice Ages. In Australia and Papua, Elasmarians would be one of the only, if not the only, ornithopods around, and could very well diversify in a whole myriad of forms, ranging from small bipedal runners to quadrupedal chunky forms and into large adrosaur-sized beasts. In South America, there would also be little reason for them to not proliferate as small to medium-sized herbivores. Given their adaptations for the cold, they might have been very well adapted for the Ice Age periods, as said previously, and once the Americas joined together in the Pliocene, they would effortlessly spread to North America, possibly as north as Alaska. One thing they have in their advantage is their egg structure. Recent studies seem to support that several lineages of dinosaurs laid soft-shelled eggs and only evolved hard-shelled eggs later in their evolution. In this case, 
only ornithopods, sauropods and theropods are known to lay hard-shelled eggs. There are indications that ceratopsians laid soft-shelled eggs, and because all other non-ornithopod ornithischians have been found without eggs associated to them, it's possible those laid soft-shelled eggs, which are harder to preserve in the fossil record than the hard shells. If elasmerians are indeed ornithopods, one could hypothesize they would be laying hard-shelled eggs. Archeld eggs are often easier to take care of in very cold conditions, if modern birds are a good analogue to take into consideration for that factor. One must not disregard, however, that we have evidence of ceratopsians and ankylosaurs living in properly cold latitudes, and having young being born in those regions indeed, so that doesn't necessarily need to be a feature stopping soft-shelled egg-laying dinosaurs from spreading to more icy conditions. Another clade of ornithopods is the rhabdodontomorphs. At the end of the Cretaceous, the only known raptodontomorphs were the raptodontids found in Europe. These were small to medium-sized iguanodonts. In Australia, a large representative, the Matabarosaurus, is known to have existed back in the mid-Cretaceous. Bit too early, but because we have very little fossil record from Australia in the late Cretaceous, we can assume their presence there by the end of the Mesozoic. Raptodontomorphs are however living in particularly interesting locations, Locations that will be pretty moist and lush in the beginning of the Cenozoic, but will be fastly affected as the climate gets drier. Australia, for example, will be specially affected by these changes. In Europe, lush rainforests will still survive up until the Miocene, and rhabdodontids may have the mistake of sticking to those areas before their extinction. Faunal turnovers may also be specially harsh for them, as they interchange with Asian and American fauna as the Cenozoic progresses. This, however, may not imply that they don't survive, as Africa may serve as a proper refuge for them. This leaves us with the final and most emblematic of all ornithopod groups, the Adrosauromorphs. Adrosauromorphs were widespread across every continent except Australia. Adrosauromorphs were scaly animals, and they may be susceptible to the changes in climate as it gets colder but they should be specially adapted to the temperate and tropical grasslands, more than many other ornithischians. Their dentition was specially adapted for a wide array of plants, from broadleaf trees to conifers, ferns and herbs, and it's hard to expect they wouldn't adapt to grasses. Their quadrupedal stances, often ending in hoofs, in the case of the front limbs, is highly suggestive that these dinosaurs would fill a role very similar to our timeline's junglets. Widespread across the globe, there would be little places where adrosaurs wouldn't exist. Madagascar and Oceania might be notable exceptions. While not ornithischians, we still have to analyze the ultimate and most behemotic of all herbivorous dinosaurs, the sauropods. Sauropods were widespread across every landmass, including Madagascar and even Antarctica. However, there will be a huge variety of sauropods that will suffer and another part will prosper with its ease. As the climate becomes moisture and more forested throughout the whole world, sauropods will be forced to adapt to this condition, possibly favoring tree-feeding sauropods or smaller varieties, due to the intense lack of space these giant animals would have in a place dominated by trees. Nemectosaurs, Eolopodids, Magyarosaurs, Lyrhinosaurs and Saltosaurins are examples of a few that could have benefited from this. But as floral turnovers occur and grasslands open, there will be a good portion of sauropods that will suffer. Fortunately, sauropods have very simple dentitions. They didn't chew, they just stripped the vegetation from the ground and let the stomach do the work. In this sense, they could adapt to a grass-based diet if needed. Sauropods that laid close to the ground in terms of posture could be among the ones that survive until the modern era. Sauropods like Nemectosaurs and Saltosaurins could be widespread across the plains of Eurasia, Africa and the Americas. In Madagascar, the native sauropods may survive, however, as the forests are still abundant. Australia will suffer severe droughts as the Miocene arrives, however, and that may prove specially harsh for the native sauropods, so maybe there won't be sauropods living in the modern days there. And now we shift to the menaces of the dinosaur world, the theropods. Although traditionally seen as a carnivorous group of dinosaurs, there is actually a myriad of herbivorous and omnivorous representatives of this extraordinary group. The first theropods we are going to tackle are the ceratosaurs. Ceratosaurs are a very diverse group, often very overlooked by all others. 
At the end of the Cretaceous, ceratosaurs were largely found on the southern continents, in South America, Africa, Madagascar, India and Australia, as well as Europe, despite being on the north. Two different groups existed, the Abelisaurids and the Noasaurs. The Noasaurs are a complicated group as it is possible a few groups of Noasaurs do not form a monophyletic group together and may actually be unrelated with each other. However, traditionally, Noasaurs are divided into the Elaphrosaurs and the Noasaurins. A few other Noasaurs may fall outside either of these, like some enigmatic Indian Noasaurs, but generally that's how they are separated. The Noasaurins were represented by bipedal carnivores or omnivores with weird and sharp teeth, and some had even weird feet only supported by the middle toe. These were found in South America and Madagascar, and presumably Africa and India as well. As the Cenozoic progresses, they may very well successfully diversify into more carnivorous creatures, or into more omnivorous or even herbivorous forms. Cursorial and burrowing forms could exist and as land masses collide, they could spread into Asia and even North America. Elaphrosaurs were much different. These were toothless as adults and were herbivorous. They have been known to exist in South America, Africa and Australia during the Cretaceous. However, their remains are painfully fragmentary. By the end of the Cretaceous, Elaphrosaurs were not found in South America, contrary to slightly older strata. Australia may preserve some forms there, however, and given the latitude of such remains, it's pretty possible they were preserving feathers in their body to maintain a warm body temperature. In Africa, it's hypothesized large forms existed and maybe these could spread into Eurasia as Africa collides and potentially spread across the rest of the world given they could have the potential to spread to colder areas. The other major group of Cretaceous ceratosaurs are the Abelisaurids. These were carnivorous and predatory, characterized by short boxy heads and arms so tiny that would make a tyrannosaur laugh. Abelisaurids were, back then, spread across South America, Africa, Europe, Madagascar and India, and they were also divided into several subfamilies. South America was dominated by the Carnotaurins, long-legged fast-dwelling predators. As the climate changed to more drier environments, Carnotaurins may see an advantage on their side, but peril may come as interchanges between American fauna occur by the Pliocene, with threatening North American competition. In Africa, Europe, Madagascar and India, there were the Majungasaurans. These had shorter legs, slightly more elongated skulls, they were adapted to take down archer prey, possibly adapted to hunt down sauropods. As Africa, Europe and India start to become connected with Asia and subsequently North America, conditions for Majungasaurian proliferation are created, but the arrival of ice ages may restrict these giant predators to warmer environments which may have them dominant predators in regions like Africa or Southern Asia, but will leave ground for other predators to dominate the colder regions. Now we jump to the Tetanurans, a massive and diverse group of theropods. Most, if not all, representatives of the Tetanurans during the end of the Cretaceous were part of the Theolurosaur group, a group well known for displaying largely feathered theropods, even though it is pretty likely other groups of theropods also had feathers. Megaraptorans are a group of tetanurans with exact phylogenetic position is yet to be resolved, and we just don't know exactly if they are silurosaurs or not. Megaraptorans were pretty rare by the end of the Cretaceous, but we know they were likely present in South America and Oceania. The fact that South American predatory assemblage of dinosaurs was largely composed by abelisaurids and union logids, more on that later, it isn't unreasonable to believe that megaraptorans were in decline there, and they may go extinct there. Meanwhile, in Oceania, they would be the only large theropods present, and they could diversify into a myriad of different forms, from small to medium-sized predators and into gigantic predators. Megaraptorans are very notable theropods, and in an antithetic way to abelisaurids, they had huge arms ending in powerful ends that could bend in ways not previously seen in other theropods, and supported huge sharp claws. These were very ferocious looking animals. True Theolurosaurs included mostly feathered animals, but Tyrannosaurs were a proper exception. Although basal and small Tyrannosaurs were likely covered in feathers, the larger forms, the ones present in the latest Cretaceous, 
were mostly scaly and naked. These were powerful predators. Some were among the largest fully terrestrial predators that Earth has ever witnessed. With the changing climate, however, tyrannosaurs could be affected, especially the lineage relative to the most famous of them all, the Tyrannosaurus rex. The Tyrannosaurinins were dependent on herbivores like Adrosaurs, Ceratopsids and Ankylosaurs, but the times they are changing and they may suffer with the extinction of a few and the opening of large prairies makes their preferred habitats a scarcity. With the decline of Tyrannosaurinins, Aliorammins, a group of Tyrannosaurs with relatively longer snouts, were more adapted to the changing times. These were smaller Tyrannosaurs, less dependent on megafauna and possibly more prepared for cursorial-like lifestyles. These could be specially prepared for a life in the widespread tropical and temperate steppes and savannas of the world. Another, more basal group of Tyrannosaurs, present by the end of the Cretaceous, were the Dryptosaurs. These were more basal and inhabited the eastern part of North America, which shortly before the end of the Cretaceous was connected to the western part. Eventually, the growth of forests could have benefited the Dryptosaurs to spread. Given their basality, they could have had more extensive feathered integument, and that could benefit them in conquering the colder climates and become dominant predators on those regions. As we move to more feathered ground, we meet the Ornithomimosaurs. By the end of the Cretaceous, there were two families of Ornithomimosaurs, the Ornithomimids and the Dinochirids. The Dinochirids were the least diverse, but likely the most awesome. By the end of the Cretaceous, the only Dinochirid was Dinochirus, a massive herbivorous toothless theropod with a hump on its back and a weird bill. It also had massive arms on its possession. Dinochirid evolution is poorly understood, but it would be interesting to see where they could go. With the thermal maximum that would occur in the Paleocene-Eocene, however, I fear the temperate climates that the Dinochirids favored would be reaped from the Earth, and these could die out early on. Ornithomimids, however, are the most abundant and the most well-known. These were represented by largely fast-dwelling runners like Gallimimus, Struthiomimus and Ornithomimus. With the initial growth of forests across the globe, Likely smaller species would deal better against the changes, but once the world becomes drier and cooler, Ornithomimids could explode in diversity afterwards and be spread across most continents, except Oceania and Antarctica. Now we move to Therizinosaurs. Just like Ornithomimosaurs, Therizinosaurs were herbivorous feathered dinosaurs. These were represented by a slightly more upright posture. They had huge arms and in extremely long claws. These animals were specially adapted to browse tall trees, so they would have specially proliferated in the early days of the Cenozoic. However, as the climate gets drier, they would be forced to stick to forested areas further into the tropics, into Africa or South Asia. Alvarez swords were yet another weird group of feathered theropods. These were characterized for being largely small insect eaters, with small arms ending in just one claw. There were alvarezsaurs living in the Americas and in Eurasia back at the end of the Cretaceous. In South America, alvarezsaurs were slightly different than the ones found in the Northern Hemisphere. Some could grow to huge sizes, around the size of emus, and they may have been omnivorous cursorial ground dwellers. Because alvarezsaur teeth were very small, it is not implausible to think they could lose them as time progresses and maybe even evolve a beak in their mouths. South American forms could evolve to cursorial, emu and rhea-like forms, proliferating in the dry and prairie areas, with smaller forms exploring the rainforests and spreading into North America however they could after the Pliocene. Northern alvarez sores were generally smaller, however. Some had enormous tails on their back, presumably to balance their bodies while they dig for insects on the dirt or on the bark of the trees. These would be sort of dino pangolins, but without the armor. Conditions could be favorable for their proliferation in areas like Africa and Asia, just like modern pangolins. Oviraptorosaurs were yet another group of feathered dinosaurs. These were already much closer to birds, notably due to their structure of their feathers. Oviraptorosaurs were still incapable of flight, their wings were just used for display. There were three groups of oviraptorosaurs at the end of the Mesozoic, the Azimimids, the Xenagnatids, and the oviraptorids. 
The Avimimids were a small group, they were kind of like quails, small omnivorous beaked animals overall. There isn't any indication against a worldwide proliferation in a myriad of habitats and guilds. The most notable of the oviraptorosaurs are either the Cynagnatids or the oviraptorids. Cynagnatids are characterized by the largest of the group found in North America and Asia. These may have been largely herbivorous dinosaurs, but they wouldn't say no to meat in occasion. Enzu was a very large animal of this family. Cynagnatids could proliferate in the forests that the early times would provide, but would eventually decline, possibly until extinction, as the climate gets drier. And this leads us to the super diverse oviraptorids. Already at the end of the Cretaceous, oviraptorids were diverse in terms of diet, size, and lifestyle, even though they were only found in Asia. Their versatility would allow them to more easily adapt to a myriad of climates and guilds, and in that sense, they would have an easier time becoming one of the most relevant parts of oviraptorids or diversity. Now we move to the Paravians, the group that includes birds and many other more primitive members. Firstly, we have to take into account that the Paravian phylogeny is pretty complicated to ascertain, and many groups may instead have members assigned to them that could be unrelated to one another. So I'm going to address them as much as traditional phylogenetic conventions allow. One interesting group of Paravians that exists is the Trudontids. Trudontids were omnivorous raptors that existed in the northern hemisphere. These were fast and opportunistic, but were not very strong predators, targeting small prey most of all. These would make Trudontids specially abundant and widespread across the globe, if given the chance, exploring all sorts of habitats, from forests to swamps to savannas to deserts to mountains to tundras, you name it. The Eudromiosaurs are what some call the traditional raptors. These include famous animals like the Velociraptor. Eudromiosaurs were carnivorous, with huge sickle claws prepared to hunt any unsuspecting prey. They were also very diverse, and they are perfect candidates to occupy small to medium-sized predatory gills across the globe. Uninelagids are a more enigmatic group of Paravians, whose exact phylogenetic position is to be ascertained. Uninelagids are believed to include members known to be present in Asia, Europe, Africa, Madagascar, possibly India by extension, South America and Antarctica, as well as Australia by extension. Already these were widespread. They were characterized by large ground dwellers like the South American Austroraptor, the flying or gliding Rayonavis from Madagascar, and the aquatic duck-like Oscaraptor from Asia. With the changing times, Uninelagids could be super diverse, becoming forest dwellers, plain dwellers and swamp dwellers in various regions of the globe across the Americas, Oceania, Eurasia, Africa and Madagascar. And now we go to Avialens. Avialens is the group that includes birds and most of its extinct relatives. Some were slightly more primitive, still having claws on its wings, long bony tails and teeth on their beakless snouts. Balaurids from Europe are believed to have been the basal most undisputed avialens of that time. These were flightless and omnivorous forest dwellers. With the invasion of creatures from Asia and North America and the subsequent dissolving of the rainforests, sadly these avialens may perish after all. Another group of diverse avialens were the Enantiornithians. These had a short tail, but traditionally have a beakless to snout. However, some Enantiornithians did evolve beaks with little to no teeth, like Gobipteryx or the recently described Falcatocheli. A few may have even been flightless, like the South American Jungavalucris. Others were like the Avisaurus, large flying predators. Enantiornithis were very diverse and abundant, and all sorts of forms could exist all across the globe. Now we move to Eornithis where a myriad of avialens exist. Many were closely related to true birds, but weren't birds per se. These were very variable and were characterized, mostly, by the presence of beaks and few teeth. Patagopterygiforms were mostly found in South America and were flightless avialens. These could survive in South America even to the present day unless faunal turnovers caused them doom. A wide variety of non-avian ornithorans existed back then, 
Some were simple waterfall or wader-like animals, and these could be widespread across the globe. Ixiornithians were seagull-like, but arbored some teeth on their mouths. These could get widespread as well. Esperornithians were also widespread. These ranged from small flying grab-like forms that explored freshwater regions to large 2-3 to three meter long oceanic divers. Freshwater and brackish water dwellers could last until the modern days, but that could be different for the oceanic dwelling ones if they are affected by the Eocene Oligocene extinction, which affected the oceans most of all. In their absence, Vegavids could potentially replace them in the oceans. Vegavids were aquatic divers too, but unlike Esperornithians, they were more abundant in the southern hemisphere. Their exact phylogenetic position is uncertain, and despite being traditionally classified as birds, they might not have been true birds at all. Nevertheless, these could eventually become relevant aquatic avial and fauna across the globe. Meanwhile, true birds would still stick with this fair share of diversification. Without the KPG, birds would likely not have the same diversity as they would have in our timeline, possibly having several guilds be occupied by other avialans like Enantiornithians and Nonavian Ornithorans. True birds, also called Neornithians, would likely stick into guilds we know they already occupied by then. Plover and rail-like birds are known to have existed. Ancestors of ducks and geese were around, and they could occupy guilds very similar to these, and maybe even expand to flamingo-like creatures too. Some could take into the seas and occupy guilds similar to tropic birds, for instance. Others were more ground dwellers, like the ancestors of landfowl, wandering in the forest floors and in plains, pecking and digging in the ground. Ancestors of modern ratids were likely also like that, small fowl-like ground-dwelling peckers not too different from the modern tinamous. The oceans would see a brand new diversity of fish. The KPG was specially harsh for some groups of fish, but with its absence we could see a brand new ichthyophonal assemblage. There's a huge amount of stuff just to speak about Cretaceous fish, and I'm sadly not as informed as I would be for other animals, like dinosaurs, but one thing is certain, there's a whole world to be explored just in regards to the diversity of these fantastic sea creatures. One of the highlights that I think should be taken into account when speaking about a new fish that would be living in the present would be the presence of brand new types of creatures that have been dominating the Mesozoic, but were sadly wiped out by the asteroid or were left in a very bad shape afterwards. Pachycormids are of special mention. Pachycormids include a wide variety of fish and the most relevant were filter feeding ones, like Bonerictes. With the arrival of the Ice Ages, conditions for filter feeders would be favorable, and a myriad of these fish could be seen in the oceans of the world, perhaps even giant species could come out from this. Meanwhile, some pachycormids mimicked the modern swordfish despite being completely unrelated, so these could fill the role in their place. We also add the ichthyodactids, a varied group of hunters that included small fish like threesops and giant predators like zipactinus. These could play an interesting role in the oceans. Pycnodontiforms were a whole different group of fish, adapted for a durophagus diet not too different from modern triggerfish. These were abundant in the Cretaceous, but suffered with the KPG before they went extinct millions of years later. In this timeline, despite some declines, I'd suppose they could still be abundant in the present. Sharks would naturally remain as diverse and menacing as they are today, ranging from pelagic hunters to bottom-dwelling feeders and maybe even filter-feeding forms like today. Rays would take different shapes too. Back in the Cretaceous, the sclerorhynchiforms existed. These were superficially very similar to modern sawfish, but were actually unrelated to them, and without a KPG to weaken their relevance, I'd suppose they could replace the sawfish from our timeline. Beyond vertebrates, Invertebrates also suffered from the effects of the KPG. I believe one of the most notable changes can be seen in cephalopods. Back at the end of the Cretaceous, four different groups of cephalopods existed, to which only two exist in our present. The nautiloids, the ammonites, the belemnites, and the neocolioids. Ammonites and belemnites went extinct with the KPG, while the other two cephalopods survived until the present and radiated greatly. 
The extinction of ammonites led to the diversification and proliferation of nautiloids at a degree. Neocolioids include the soft-bodied cephalopods, which are the squids, the octopus and the vampire squids. Back in the Cretaceous, the lineage leading to modern squids wasn't very common, at least in the fossil record. Back then, the equivalent of squids were actually relatives of the vampire squid or the octopus, including animals like the plesiotusids and the enchotusids, which were superficially very squid-like. Octopus themselves were also pretty present in the late Cretaceous rocks, but not so much squids. I wouldn't expect an alternate timeline where squid aren't as abundant and diverse as nowadays, though other extinct groups of cephalopods must also be taken into consideration. The belemnites were like squids, but they had a cone-like shell. They were already declining at the end of the Cretaceous, so I wouldn't think they would last until the present. Ammonites, despite having suffered accentuated declines throughout their history, were dealing very well, diversifying in several different species, with differently shaped shells, with different sizes to match. Dedicated surface dwellers, a good amount of ammonites are believed to have been filter feeders, so, in a stark contrast to our timeline, this alternate timeline could see a huge diversity of ammonites, even into the modern days. Eventually the world would seamlessly look like an extended Mesozoic. But one question stands. Could we humans live here? We likely could, very well. The atmospherical conditions are favorable, the water, the food and the other resources are essentially the same, we would just be living with brand new beasts alongside us. I think a more interesting question is, would something like we evolve in this world? It's technically possible. It's not a new idea to imagine a sapient creature evolve in an alternate timeline where the asteroid didn't fail. Hypothetical sapient dinosaurs are a possible alternative for what could inherit this alternate civilization, but I think no avian dinosaurs are a very weak bet. Their brains weren't very well advanced, even the raptors, which are continuously depicted as smart animals in media. They just weren't that bright-minded. I would bet on a mammal. And despite looking like an odd choice, given that this is not the age of mammals, it still doesn't mean mammals can take an important part. After all, primates weren't the most dominant of mammals in the Cenozoic era, so imagining a mammal evolved to smarter grounds isn't implausible. Mammals have, comparatively, a much more advanced brain than known avian dinosaurs, and based on modern species, very intelligent mammals like elephants, dolphins and primates have evolved their advanced intelligence independently, so they certainly have it easy. Mammals, being animals that are forced to engage in parental care, have more ease in developing social bonds too, and society is an important part of an advanced sapient creature. Imagining a Boreoeusir mammal developing prehensile ends and an advanced brain and a complex society could be the best bet for a new sapient animal in this time. Though the most likely end is that nothing like that happens. Human-like creatures are especially unlikely thing to evolve. It only happened once in the whole vast history of planet Earth. Assuming it will happen again is a very naive assumption and one that isn't favored by the probabilities. And to imagine that a random space rock falling on Earth 66 million years ago was the righteous response to serve our odds is what dictates our existence as both a weird happening and as a fascinating turn of events. So this is the end for this massive brainstorming compilation of possible scenarios that we would witness had the asteroid never hit the Earth 66 million years ago. I hope you enjoyed it, I certainly have as this is an issue that interests me personally. But the reality is a crude one, and we won't have to worry about these alternate worlds to live our crazy little lives. So, for the sake of saving you the time that is left for you, I will peace out. See you next time.